Hey guys, Connor here from CameraStore.com and today I'm joined by Nico from Camera Rescue and we're going to be going over some of the top 35mm SLRs of 2022. So yeah, let's just get right into it. So the top one is Old Reliable, it's the Canon AE-1 and AE-1 program. We put them together because there's a lot of confusion when you're searching for these models. This is, according to Canon, the most popular and mo best-selling 35mm SLR of all time. There was a huge marketing campaign for these when they came out in the 70s and early 80s. And, you know, they've, they've garnered a reputation as incredible student cameras, incredible cameras to learn on. They have um, aperture priority or shutter priority and full program exposure. So yeah. great cameras for photographers of any skill level. Yeah, and I think the A1 is always on the top of the list we've been doing. We've done a few over the years and the A1 is just high, high end. Also adding those two A1 and A1 program actually probably makes the stats a little higher, but still it's always on the top. Everybody loves the ease of it, the look of it, they have it in black and silver, they're plenty full. You can still buy them pretty affordably if you find them at you know thrift stores and things like that. They usually overexpose around one stop by default and that is kind of good if you're shooting color negative. Makes your scans look a little nicer and not you know crunched blacks and so on. Um, but yeah, the AE-1 is the number one of the list. Yeah, excellent cameras overall. Yeah. So. Plus Canon FD glass is yes. still quite affordable, the low end versions, the high end have gone really high. It's getting up there. Yeah, thanks to cinematographers. But yeah, 51.8 is really good lens. Mm -hmm. You don't need anything else. So the next one on our list is actually a bit of a surprise. I mean, not a surprise if you've used one, but a surprise if you've seen previous lists and a surprise if you, you know, are working intimately with these cameras the way that we do. And it's the Nikon F3, which is a professional grade, SLR, the first Nikon uh, electronic professional 35 millimeter SLR, released in 1980. This is one of the smoothest, best cameras to use of, of any SLR out there, but... It's never really been on the top list, which is one of the biggest surprises, is always the F2, the FM2, the FE2 are usually on the top top, but this year the F3 is ruling. I think they've been underpriced for quite a long time due to the extra size, um, but they're really, really nice to use. They have a lot of features that are great, uh, and we basically love using them. We, there's actually a video that you did on how to use it, which is pretty cool. Um, I've shot with the titanium version just to try it out. It wasn't my kind of camera, but yeah. It was not first love for the, uh, the electronic use for users. But I think nowadays, after all these years, they have been you know, reliable enough to be on the high end of wanting to shoot film. And Nikon glass also is very mm -hmm. undervalued because the digital market doesn't really love Nikon anymore. No. And uh, yeah, like you were saying, I think the, there was some hesitance, or at least there are stories of hesitance among professionals to adopt an electronic camera after the mastery of the F and F2 for a long time. Um, but these, again, yeah, like you said, have proven to be incredibly reliable, uh, robust cameras, very easy to use, the smoothest advance of any 35 millimeter camera. You go out and test as many as you can, this is the smoothest one. And it's 40 years, 41 years old from since release, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And also, like Connor said, top of the line of the professional line. So like you had the F1 or the F, the F2, F3, F4, F5, F6. The F3 is just the beast. So yeah, top of the line. Probably the only top of the line except for the F2 and F. Like we don't have any Canon F1s on the list, but no. we won't spoil the list. Well, you can actually see the cameras yourself. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And then anything else on that one? No, I think, I mean, we'll probably talk more about it when we introduce the next one, because I think the relationship between these two cameras is pretty interesting. So the next one on the list is the Nikon FM2, which released two years later in 1982. Um, this sort of is maybe more popular today than it ever was when it was sold new. Um, and I think that it basically comes from photographers today having different needs than photographers at the time. Professional photographers in the early 80s when the F3 was released wanted interchangeable prisms, focusing screens, a ton of accessories. They basically wanted to tailor their shooting to whatever very specific situation they needed. But photographers today are taking their camera everywhere 
and using it for everything. And this smaller body with a single prism and focusing screen that suits most needs is a great option. And yeah. fast shutter speeds, they have a great shutter sync at 1 250th of a second, which is you know, excellent if you're doing flash. Uh, fully mechanical up to 1 4,000th, so that's a great shutter speed. And yeah. yeah. And, and I think like you're very right with the fact that today, like everybody wants, everybody shooting film is mostly not shooting sports or, you know, uh, war or anything like that. So they don't need all those extra bells and whistles that come with the professional line, the F line. So the FM2 is, like you said, mechanical, small, and kind of like one package that does pretty much not everything, but it suits very well the entry level film photographer, not so entry level two. Uh, but it's not like the beast that an F3 is. It's just small, nice, compact, easy to carry. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it maybe doesn't suit you as well if you're a hyper macro photographer. Yeah. The, like the F, the customizability of the more professional Fs would suit that better. But if you're going out and shooting just generally, this, you know, fits in a bag better. It has all the neck. features you need. Yeah, it doesn't hurt your shoulders. Yeah. Uh, you know, built-in double exposures if you want to. A lot of people do that. love that nowadays, yeah. which is very interesting. I never thought it was a cool feature back in the day, but nowadays people really enjoy the double exposures. But yeah, and which one do we have in number three? I'm cheating with the list, so. Oh, four. <laughs> number four. Number four is another old reliable student camera. It's the Pentax K1000. So this is a, another fully mechanical SLR. This one was released in 1976 and was actually produced until 1997, giving it one of the longest production runs of any 35 millimeter camera. Um, they moved production from Japan to China at some point and the, the quality you know, went down because these were intended to be student cameras, very cheaply made, very cheap to buy. People that are dabbling in photography, taking a darkroom class, these, this would be the kind of camera that your teacher would recommend. So. Yeah. And I think, They've like throughout the years we've seen online how people would recommend the hey I'm new to film what camera would you recommend mm -hmm. and I think most of the cameras on this table now are part of that list like the AE1 the Pentax uh, K1000 what a lot of people don't understand is the K1000 is great but the Spotmatic is also a great alternative mm -hmm. for the K1000 because prices of the K1000 thanks to that hype from people recommending it so much because it was so available and cheap have made the demand. A high in the price increase is the Spotmatic is really nice. But yeah, and also Pentax glass is so, so nice. Like the Takumar 50, what will have 1.4, but the 1.8 and also on are just really nice. Also, again, small camera, not so many features. The 1 1,000th maximum shutter speed is not the best, but honestly, I mean, unless you're shooting like 50 ISO in the daylight and you want 1.4 aperture, you should be fine for pretty much everything. Yeah. Yeah, it, it has everything you need and, every, and nothing that you don't. It's just a simple match needle. It's actually, it's great that you mentioned the Spotmatic because this is a Spotmatic with the Pentax K-mount. It's the exact same camera inside. I mean, the, the K-mount gives you access to newer lenses with better, better coatings um, and open aperture metering. So there are some Spotmatics that can do that, but all the K-mount ones can, so that's yeah. you know a big advantage for if some you people. Can't afford the K-1000 and you still want something? Go for the Spotmatic. You won't regret it. Mm -hmm. Probably. Maybe if you're missing, if you really need those things, but no, you should be fine. And the Spotmatic is quite pretty in black, mm -hmm. to be honest. Oh, yeah. Extra points. So yeah, let's we'll move on to the next one, which is, I think another surprise because I still see this camera as somewhat underrated, at least historically. Yeah. Um, this is the the Canon A1. It is a semi-professional model released in 1978. It is the first SLR to feature uh, all four modes. So uh, program, aperture priority, shutter priority, and full manual. The um, Minolta XD, their professional camera at the time, uh, had shutter and aperture priority and sort of a, a weird computer override system that is kind of like program but this was the first camera to feature fully programmed exposure, the first 35 millimeter SLR. So very important historically. And obviously that feature became super popular with our number one option, the AE1 program, but it was introduced here by the A1. Yeah, I think the A1 also has been underpriced because of the 
like the fame of the AU1. And th lately, and we're talking this last past year for Google searches, basically, for what we data we get from, the, well, you guys get from the store. But basically, the A1 has been always behind the A1, but there are also some uh, popular YouTubers. I have made, I think Willem made a video on the A1 as one of his favorite 35s, which immediately puts it from like number eight to number five. Uh, nowadays, social media is one of the biggest traffic drivers to websites and shopping. So I think that's one of the reasons. This is my personal copy, which I quite enjoy. It uh, has the Canon cough, which, you know, is fine if you don't mind the noise, but it is a really good user camera and, you know, stick a lens and choose one of the modes and you can shoot away. I've shot around with my kids with that camera a lot and it still performs amazingly. Yeah, I, I think that as a, if, if you're a, an AE1 user, I think um, shutter priority auto exposure is maybe a bit limiting for some people. Yeah. Um, so being able to have that fully programmed exposure or aperture priority, which I think creatively is maybe a bit nicer, yes. um, is a big benefit. And especially if you can find these at the same prices or even cheaper than the AE1, it really is just more camera for your money, yeah. um, as it was designed to be. Hopefully it'll go up in the list for next year. I have a feeling that it will. So number six. Yeah, the next one up is the granddaddy of them all the oldest camera on our list, the original Nikon F. So this is the camera that started it all basically in terms of SLR dominance. Um, before this camera came out, rangefinders were really the professional option. But when this released in 1959, it basically conquered the entire market. This is based on the Nikon SP and the other S series of rangefinders. So we have, which themselves are based on um, contacts rangefinders. So yeah, we have a, a contacts rangefinder here that it's, it's hard to see the similarity here, the family resemblance, but this, basically these pre-war and World War II era Contax rangefinders ended up being the basis for the Nikon F, um, which is pretty ironic, I think, because if you look at what we have here, which is a, a Contarex SLR um, that was released around the same time as the Nikon F by Contax or Zeiss Icon, you really see why <laughs> This one, and the Contour X didn't. Um, this is simple, this is intuitive, this works. It just works. It just works so well, and it makes sense in your hands the way that you need training to operate a Contour X. Yeah, and one thing that I find interesting, if I can have this one quickly, yeah. is the fact that as they basically uh, adapted the rangefinder to an SLR, is the shutter button is not actually on the front like the other cameras but it's actually on the back, which I find slightly annoying, uh, being used to like more modern cameras that the shutter's here, your finger has to kind of like go backwards a little bit. And it's very interesting. It has a very, like it's really small, has like professional features for the time, of course. And uh, this is with the little prism, which I think, is the prism interchangeable in these ones? Yep. Yeah, I'm not a big uh, 35 SLR expert. But yeah, the fact that you can change the prism, I guess, is a professional feature that most people didn't have back then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's so small yeah. and it's just so nice, to be honest. And being from 1959, mm -hmm. when the M3 was around, you know, yeah. suddenly you could see what you were focusing on. You could see depth of field in real time, all these features that were not on rangefinders. So yeah. they took over pretty fast, I'm guessing, but mm -hmm. yeah. And it's on the list because it's Nikon F. So also people when they're searching probably, yes. they write Nikon F, which is also the mount, the Nikon F mount. So that probably gives it a bit of an advantage, but still we think it deserves being on yeah. the top 10 of the 35 SLRs. Yeah, it's worth mentioning for historical value alone. Yes. And a lot, the thing you mentioned about the shutter is, is a, a great point and something that you know people complained about. They also complained that the body was a bit angular. Um, and all of these were addressed by our next camera, the Nikon F2, which was released in 1971 and basically fixed or improved everything that people thought was wrong about the F. And for many people, this would be the most iconic, ideal um, 35 millimeter SLR. It's fully mechanical. It has the same interchangeable prisms. The shutter has been moved to the front, so it's a little bit more intuitive if you're used to that. Uh, there's a faster max shutter speed of one two thousandth. 
Um, some other small quality of life things like mirror lockup um, is much better on this than the original F. Uh, the back doesn't all slide off. It's a standard oh, a hinge back. Yep. So yeah, another excellent camera. Nikon hits it out of the park for basically two decades. I mean, in the film days, Nikon was the one that was over. And I think that also explains sometimes when we look at the searches is like people want to get into film and maybe nowadays Canon, Sony and other brands are on the top, but like Nikon in the film days had so much like glass, so much like bodies, professional bodies, features and so on, where Canon was kind of like lagging quite a bit behind. And maybe on the user side of the A1s, A1s, maybe it was more there, but professional line just was ki like killing it with Nikon. So there's so many options and glass, like just how much glass was made yeah. is also a great feature. Plus as nobody really loves Nikon so much nowadays, they're still quite affordable. They're moving to the, you know, um, mirrorless mount. So F is getting left behind and yeah. that makes it a good option for picking up, you know, a film camera and the cinematographers don't like Nikon glass because yeah. it focuses the other way around. Yeah. Uh, which makes a lot of focus pullers, uh, you know, not like it. And we do have to take into account that, like the cinematography world yeah. loves classic lenses and focusing the other way around just makes it disliked by, you know, focus pullers, basically. Interesting choice. I don't really know why Nikon did that, but, you know, they made that decision in 1959. They weren't thinking about cinematographers converting their lenses no. at that time. It was just, that's just how they did it. Um, but it does, it gives their, their lenses sort of a protection from cinematographers and, and video and digital shooters who don't want to have to change how their brain works when they switch lenses. Um, so Nikon glass is, is, will be out there and won't be being rehoused. So um, much. Well, maybe rehoused that they can do the whole helicoid, but yeah. just don't do that, guys. Let's <laughs> let, leave, leave us a system that we can Please. still afford. <laughs> But it's, it's, yeah, they may not be as popular today, but as you can see from the table, they're well represented with 35 millimeter cameras. So a, a lot of film still shooters pick Nikon. Yeah. And that makes sense because they were the, the dominant force in stills. Um, everybody was trying to catch up and copy off of Nikon's homework. The next one is another Nikon. <laughs> another Nikon. Another Nikon. This is almost like the top 10 Nikon cameras. Yeah, we have, what is it? One, two, three, four, five of the top 10 are Nikons. So the next one is the FE2, which is the electronic version of the earlier FM2 that we talked about. It released one year later in 1983. And so basically the advantage of this model is that it has uh, auto exposure. You can do aperture priority auto exposure, which you can't do with the FMs. Um, it has a mechanical shutter speed, so just one, one two fiftieth, if you don't want to put a battery in it. But it is battery dependent. But the advantage, again, is that you get uh, exposure compensation, you get uh, aperture priority, and you, yeah, you get a more flexible shooting style, I think, because of it. I think also we have to account today's world, and this is why we're doing the list of 2022, is the users that are getting into film don't always want to learn all the rules about shooting film. So aperture priority makes it extremely easy and fun to shoot. If you are moving around between different exposures and like light conditions from shadow to light daylight or apertures from 1.4 to like f8 or whatever, having that done by the camera is really convenient and they really nailed that. And that with color negative, which is nowadays the most popular choice, uh, more than size, uh, is just makes it a great combo. Any new guy that gets into film or a new user that gets into film is just gonna pick up this and start shooting. And it's an AE1 with one four thousand of a second basically uh, which is really really nice and mechanical shutter speed if you run out of battery or don't have batteries so you can pretty much shoot by choosing the aperture that you need and that mac like fixed shutter speed basically yeah and talking to customers which you know we do every day uh most people getting into film are not they're really excited to jump straight into manual and i know that there's some people who that's how they learn, they want to throw themselves in the deep end, but most people want to sort of play with, dip their toes into it and learn gradually. And I think something like this that's battery dependent and has more advanced features, whereas it may not be as popular as the FM2, this is probably a better camera for most people. 
Yeah, and one thing I think is very interesting that we haven't mentioned from the whole list is this is top 35 uh, SLRs. There's not one modern SLR. Yeah. Have you noticed there's no Canon 300s, 1Vs, 1Ns, there's no Nikon F80s, 100s. And that's really interesting. I think that tailors a lot to the user base nowadays are people that want a film camera that looks like a film camera. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is being seen in the digital world by people making cameras that look retro in a style. And I feel people want a film camera that looks like a film camera, shoots like a film camera, and so on, so on. So like, that's really interesting in the list. I was just looking right now, I was like, wait, nothing looks yeah. modern. Yeah. Um, aesthetics is important as much as the results nowadays for the users. Yeah, I mean, that's Fuji's whole business model. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you see the Nikon ZFC and the DF. DF, yes, yeah. the full frame. Um, that's, that's what they're playing off of is, is nostalgia for the most part. And yeah. I mean, even for, for people like me and, and younger people getting into this that, that don't have nostalgia because they weren't here for the time that these cameras were released, but you still feel the history and you still understand that, that this is old and <laughs> a Canon EOS 300 One. looks like a camera you can buy today. Yeah. And that, you know, despite them being more advanced, despite them having features that the people who invented these could never dream of, um, it just doesn't feel the same. And, and there's something to be said for that. And that's why you see what you see. And even though we, we recommend those autofocus SLRs to people just getting into film because they're affordable, they're affordable, they're easy to use, and your shots will look good. Like they're often working. These, despite all their charms, require repair quite often. So if you find one in a secondhand store, it's hard to tell if it's working, but if you find a Minolta Dynax or a Canon EOS, it's more or less gonna be okay. If it turns on, the, I, what I've always heard in the camera rescue is if an electronic you know, SLR turns on, it probably works. Like it's, it's electronically controlled the shutter. So like, you're not going to have a slow 1-1000 or something like that. That will happen more with a mechanical, you know, mostly mechanical cameras. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good choice, I think, for anybody getting in and is watching this video and seeing the top 10 and being like, whoa, I can't afford pretty much any other table. Those Canon EOS 300, Nikon F65s and so on, Minolta, I'm not your Minolta boy, um, yeah, like are very, very affordable, good, ugly, but really good. So jump on that if you really want to get into filming can't afford one of these retro uh cameras yeah and what do we have number eight number eight or number nine number is nine. the olympus om1 so this is a another fully mechanical camera that's a, a sort of a trend in the list is um bad, not being battery dependent the om1 uh released in 1972 and really turned the whole slr world on its head and it's you know you can see this released one year earlier than Nikon F2, and you can just see the size difference between these. And these are both aimed at professionals. Um, obviously, Olympus um, decided not to do interchangeable prisms and focusing screens, but they were able to shrink the camera considerably and appeal to, you know, 95% of the same people as Nikon, um, losing that hyper macro crowd, losing that, that like, medical crowd. Um, but making the camera so much easier to use and so much easier to bring with you everywhere because of it. And yeah. I think that's, it's sort of a modern standpoint. Like you see that, that cameras like the FM2 are very popular these days because they're small and because they're easy to use. Um, and Olympus was thinking that in 1972, which is pretty impressive, I think. I think I've even seen ads where they would advertise that you could take two cameras if you wanted, like for the yeah. size of almost one of the F, uh, Nikon Fs is like, it was so small. Plus the viewfinder is extremely bright. Mm -hmm. uh, that paired with a 518 uh, is just, it's amazing. It looks better than real life. Yeah. Um, they're small, they're pretty reliable most times, uh, and you know, Olympus Glass again is not so, uh, you know, high-end valued right now still, um, so it's, it's understandable. And the OM line, the OM1, 2, 3, 4, so on, are pretty good cameras, but this is like the genuine first one, and I think that's why it's, you know, the only Olympus in the list is also OM Glass is searched for, so you search OM Glass. And, probably are getting some hits of cameras. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and the glass as well is, it's, it's all de designed with this ethos of, of being small. Um, a Canon, or not a, an Olympus 50 1.8 is, would be a pancake lens yeah. in any other system. Oh, the 100, like the 100 yeah. lens is like, they're like it super like tiny, they're yeah. like micro. <laughs> and I mean, they were also the ones that were making the half frame. Mm -hmm. So I guess they were like, there's a market for people that want things that are a bit more pocketable and small. Yeah. So they were like, yeah, you know, competition is making bigger stuff. We can do smaller stuff. Yeah. And the design is very iconic. Like the, the, the lines are very nice. So yeah, yeah it's, it's understandable that it's on the top 10. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all from that, that same famous Olympus, Olympus designer, Maitani, um, who designed the Olympus Pen, the XA, and the OM-1. So all with that same small aesthetic and, and desire to fit as much camera as possible into a compact package. And it really all comes together with the OM-1. Again, it put the whole SLR world on its head when it released and everybody scrambled to release their own compact SLRs to compete. So, pretty cool. Glad to see it on the list. And we'll move on now to our, our final entry here, um, which I thought was a bit of a surprise. Um, it's the, the Canon FTB, which is a, a slightly older, uh, more mechanical, it is entirely mechanical, SLR released by Canon um, early in the FD mount's lifespan. So before they had the AU-1, the A-1, these advanced auto exposure modes, they had the FTB. Um, and it's a pretty reliable camera. There's not that much to say about it. It just has a match needle, an on-off switch, and shutter speeds. Um, I think, yeah. I think the, the reason this one could be on the list is if you're searching for FD like cameras, like the A1, A1 are, like I said, going up in value quite a lot. And the FTB actually looks a lot like the more retro looking like the K1000 and the FM, well, FM, yeah, the OM1 and so on. So it does have a nice look to the camera, nice feel, and it has those lesser features and being mechanical makes it reliable in that point that usually only mechanical things can go wrong. So you can, you know, usually repair them. They're usually affordable. And uh, yeah, I think it doesn't make it hard to understand that if you're looking for an FD film camera and you see the price of the other ones, you're like, oh, well, maybe the FTB is great because it's probably on the lower end of the prices. So except for maybe the T80 and T70 and so on, which are, you know, robot looking cameras. The, the opposite end of the design spectrum. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's no surprise that it's here. I'm glad that there's a mechanical FD camera on the table. I would suggest the Canon EF2 as a very, very nice camera, but that one gets uh, over probably shadow or I don't know, covered by the EF mount. Yeah. But the uh, Canon EF is a really nice camera, Black Beauty also known as, and I own that one and love it. So yeah. I would say it's not on the top 10 because it's the same as the AF, like AF mount. So but the EF is really nice. Yeah, and, and this, the FTB actually, or the FTB QL will come with this nice quick loading system. So we have a lot of people that struggle to load 35 millimeter, especially in the beginning, because it can be difficult depending on what camera you have. And these cameras released in 1971 had these interesting systems where you basically just put the end of the film here and then this latch covers it. And it, it, it ensures that you get proper loading pretty much every time, yeah. um, which is a really smart system and they didn't continue with it, but yeah. Yeah, they changed things. I mean, film loading videos, I make them myself on my YouTube channel are extremely popular, even though people think you should know it all. But new users are uh, confused about how film is transported into cameras, taken out of cameras when they're exposed. Or where are my pictures? How do I get them on a CD? Or well, yeah. a CD sounds undated. Yeah, uh, we transfer or whatever it is on the computer phone. So like having that ease of use of like you just throw the roll, you know, pull the leader a little bit and close it like a point and shoot nowadays yeah. is very very nice. But yeah, I think uh, that ends our top 10 SLRs of uh, 35 SLRs. Um, which there will be an article, which I think Connor is going to be writing. Yeah, there will be a text version with a, a little bit more detail on each of these models, some more specs probably, uh, and some alternatives. So some cameras that didn't show up on this list that might have been or might be great choices if you're if you're looking for a first SLR or a 30th SLR. Yeah, and if not, and if you can't find something or the article doesn't help you, uh, I highly recommend you check 
camera stores uh, Q&A on Fridays on Instagram. Uh, also, you can always ask there yeah. about recommendations. We, I on Camera Rescue try to help people with the rescuing part, but Camera Store tries to help people choosing cameras and deciding what camera is best and so on. So I think it's helpful to have these videos. I'm glad I could help uh, here and ask the silly questions because I'm not so keen on 35 SLRs. But yeah, um, it's, it's a pretty cool list to see. Yeah, well, we're always happy to help um, and always happy to have you on. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you have any you know, camera that you own that you think should be on this top list, get your friends to search it because that's where we got the data from. But also leave a comment below and we can you know, have an honest discussion about what the best SLRs are. <laughs> so see you next time, guys. Bye.